you sat as a judge on the First Circuit for 14 years, and now you've been on the Supreme Court for 12. What's the difference in judging on those two levels? Well, one difference is what I wrote about in the, in the book. One difference is that on the Supreme Court, uh, we have uh, constitutional cases as a steady diet. They appear from time to time, but usually in one area, Fourth Amendment or Fifth Amendment, in the, in the courts of appeals. Here we get them all over the law. And the, the, the consequence of that is after a time, a judge on our court begins to develop a coherent view of the Constitution as a whole. And what I, what I wrote about that is I think most of us begin to see the Constitution as a document that has a set of discrete purposes. It creates a set of democratic institutions. It's designed to create democratic decision making and a certain kind of democracy to protect basic human rights, to assure a degree of equality, to divide power horizontally, three uh, departments of government, vertically, state, federal, and to assure a rule of law. Now, having said that, you have the basic purposes. And what we do, I think, here after a time is we've explored a lot of the areas of the Constitution and see how they fit together, uh, elaborating on what I've said. What do you think about the quality of the briefing that you get at the Supreme Court as opposed to the First Circuit? Is there much of a tangible difference in quality? Usually it's somewhat better here. You'll get, you'll get uh, very good briefs in the circuits on uh, a lesser number of occasions. I think the really good briefs here are more frequently found because people have more time, they get on the zin. Uh, uh, when a case gets here, uh, there are usually uh, a large number of groups and others who are interested in that case, and they'll work out uh, complex briefing systems, and uh, they'll do a pretty good job. By the time the court has granted cert and uh, you get a merits brief, mm -hmm. are the, is the briefing pretty uniformly good? Or I think it's pretty uniformly good, yeah. Mm -hmm. I do. It's, it's a different job, too, because there's another important difference. In the, when I was a Court of Appeals judge, what we're hearing are appeals from, say, a criminal conviction or, say, a decision in a trial court. And the question is, why is that lower court judge, the trial judge, wrong? Wrong about what? Well, often wrong about anything. Because often there'll be 17 different issues raised, and if the, the uh, p p petitioner or the, or the appellant is right about one of them, he has to go back and get a new trial. And so what you're looking at is the whole case, different issues, and ways of disposing of that case. Here, contrary to popular belief, we've taken a case to decide an issue, one issue usually, maybe two. And we're not looking so much at the whole case. We're looking at the way, right or wrong, of answering the question raised by that single issue. So people who brief it are focusing on that issue. At the intermediate level, is that a smart, is, is that good lawyering to come forward with 17 issues? Well, it depends on what they are. I mean, it might be, because what the lawyer wants is to uh, get a decision for his client. Now, if he throws in four of those issues, or eight, that are, he knows are no good. Well, he, the judge might not, you know, might read those eight first and draw the conclusion that he's just, uh, uh, just hot air, and uh, so he might not pay as much attention. So I wouldn't advise it. Do you have a sense that the better lawyers, though, winnow out those marginal issues yes. and go straight for the really yes. ones? Yes, they do. But you still can have uh, maybe three, maybe four. In a, in a case that this evidence was incorrectly admitted. Anyway, there's no jurisdiction. Besides that, there was a bad instruction. Well, you might have three or four uh, uh, issues like that. And all you got to do is win on one of them. And the appeals court will be looking. In fact, what I do as an appeals judge, if I think he might be right about two or three, but he's certainly right on one, well, I'll go for the one. Do you agree with this? theory that I sometimes hear, again, we're talking about intermediate court level mm -hmm. um, cases, that <clears throat> uh, it's more legitimate for criminal lawyers to bring forward a lot of issues than, um, say, in, in civil litigation. Well, legitimate, I mean, it's not a question of legitimate. People can bring as many issues as they want. <laughs> but but I, I, as the judge, am looking at the question, is this judgment right? That's what they're doing. They're appealing from a judgment 
judgment of a lower court. And if I see 19 issues there, I'm going to say, hmm, maybe he doesn't have a good case. Maybe there's a good, you know, so I, I think it's better to win over them. That would be my advice, but I can't guarantee that. What are the most important keys to persuade, persuasive brief writing? Well, again, I think in the intermediate court, it seemed to me what that attorney was trying to do is to get the judge to see the case a particular way. You know, is it a rabbit or is it a duck? It's like the famous psychological example. You have a figure, it could be seen as a rabbit or it could be seen as a duck. And there's a lot. You're going to win if you get him to see it as a duck. See, and, but the other side says, no, no, this is a rabbit. And uh, they'll, characterization will matter, and that's why I'd like the oral argument. I wanted to know how the lawyers see this case. I'm trying to think, how do they really see it? And very often, not always, but very often that helps a lot. In this court, we're not dealing with the case. It's too late to characterize. We are dealing with a legal issue. And I want to know what the answer to that issue is. What are your main tips on effective oral argument? Well, try to get out your main points in this court. It's hard to do. There are nine judges. But you want to get the main one out quickly. And probably uh, the best one you can have is to figure out what your opponent's strongest argument and make sure you get out your answer to that argument. A case is uh, only as strong as its weakest link. And I think that's sometimes a mistake. But the lawyers, the lawyers can make that mistake. They have... 15 excellent strong links. Ah, but one is weak. Well, they're going to lose. So you better tell the judge who's going to find it what's the best argument against their strongest, not their weakest. Then answer the questions. Listen to the question. It's what you tell a witness. Listen to the question. Think about it for a second. And answer that question. That judge is worried about something. So answer it. I noticed in watching the oral argument this morning that almost every judge who spoke mm -hmm. would actually signal about 30 seconds before asking the question through body language, mm -hmm. you would do this, mm -hmm. that, that you were concerned about something and you're about to speak. Um, among the myriad of things that a lawyer has to keep in mind, how important is it to sort of be aware of the body language? Uh, let's see, can, can we have time? Yeah, about uh, five more minutes. Okay. Or are the body language, in this court it's difficult because there are nine people. And uh, what I would say is that for a lawyer, if he sees one of the judges seems to want to talk and isn't going to get a chance, he tries to get that judge to say something. Because if the judge has a question and he doesn't get to say it, he's going to think about that question anyway. Therefore, it's better to try to get it out. Find out what it is, and then you can answer it. How similar do you think legislative drafting is to contractual drafting? No. Legislative drafting, there, 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 there are bodies of people. Um, I think the job of legislative drafting, I worked on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate for some time, and there were professional drafters who did a pretty good job. The, the greatest uh, difference, I think, whether the statute turned out well or didn't, was the process of exposing draft language in hearings, in public hearings, to all kinds of people who might have an interest. By, by, by getting people to testify about it and talk about what should be done, you began to see how language would work to solve their problems or not. But where something was put onto a bill in the floor uh, or without a hearing, uh, a likely mess would ensue. The language wouldn't do what people wanted it to do. And then that doesn't mean they were stupid. It means that nobody can foresee all the different ways in which a statute uh, might be used. And if you have public hearings and take your time, it's more likely you'll find out. And it's hard for contractual drafters to have that kind of scrutiny, even though That's true. their language can have this, these it sorts of It can have it, but the universe is more limited. And also, I, I suspect that contractual drafters, and this may be an advantage of a large firm, or maybe you can go to West, you can get form language. Uh, and uh, language has been produced over time, which the people in the firm, or maybe at West or other places, know will have a certain result. What if we talk about the expression of statutes more than, say, coverage, how could it be improved? 
You mean the language the that's language, used? Yeah. Well, I, I think it would be better if if the uh, uh, Department of Justice and the drafters in the uh, in the Senate and the House uh, were permitted and would have uh, look at everything and take their time and uh, try to work out form words to express it. And then the committees would use that, those words. When I was there, it was some time ago, it was in 1979, 80, and 1974, 75, 76. It, it was quite a long time ago. But, I mean, we used to go to the drafters, who were a professional group of people, who would uh, have certain forms of putting language together, and it worked pretty well, I think. At least the language would express what the, the senators and the staffs wanted to, to say. Let's say a lawyer decides, I'm not really a very good legal writer, and I'd like to become much better. What would your prescription be? Practice. The same as anything. There's very few people who can't explain things. You can do it. Read it to you get your long-suffering spouse <laughs> to listen. Your children, a few minutes a day, listen to theirs. I, I, I would just, you know, I, I, the way that I think it works best, you think of the rough kind of thing you want to say by jotting on a piece of paper, every idea you have, and it's a jumble. And then you try to create an outline. And having created that outline, you just start to fill it in. And then you read through it and say, I wonder if this is understandable. And when it isn't understandable, as it never is, you rewrite it. And then you rewrite it again. I, I think it's practice that makes the difference. It's, uh, I, I don't believe there's anyone who can't do it. But there are a lot of lawyers around who've written a whole heck of a lot, mm. but probably don't write all that well. Wouldn't you agree? Well, they may not practice what they're trying, but I, what were you, you're urging them, and I agree with it, to, to try to write clearly, practice that. And talking it through with others yes. is helpful. I think so. I think so. That's why I like the law clerks. I've got to be sure I go out of that room with a clear idea in my mind. Do you continue to learn things about writing? Yes, I do. I, uh, see, I, learn, I probably even more now. I mean, I have a number, there are a number of little gimmicks. Like, I'll often start a sentence with an and or a but. And the reason I'm doing that is because it's one thought. And this thought in law particularly can be complex. And the reason that it can be complex is law is filled with qualifications. So you start saying, well, the point here uh, is that if it's a and it's a and it isn't a and besides, all right, now we've got the phrase, we're only half through. But then start again, say, and more than that. It also has to be a da 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 and then we're not yet through, so we say, but still more. <laughs> then it can be. Now you've divided the maybe 15 necessary qualifications into three sentences instead of one long sentence. With 15, you have three sentences with five. And the fact that you've started them with an and or a but indicates to the reader that this is one idea. And then when you go to the next idea, you don't have the and or the but, and therefore they say, ah, now this is another idea. And that's useful, because we have our ideas lined up in about the same kind of category, and we have the qualifications in there, but they're connected to show it's one idea with the ands or the buts. And you like but at the beginning of a sentence better than however? Well, a but is a lesser however. <laughs> a but is, it's really part of the same idea. And a however is, but there's another equally valid thing that goes the other way. Now, that's not always true, but... Do you think lawyers have a professional obligation to be the best writers they can be? Absolutely. Absolutely. Their job, they're, they're great at taking complicated things. And that's the, a lawyer's greatest, greatest virtue, I think, to me, is that he's a generalist. And, and people who are really specialists should be able to explain this patent or explain this uh, method of setting a price or explain this steam engine or explain this computer part to that lawyer who will then take it in if he spends enough time so he really understands it and then in English can explain it to the judge who doesn't have that much time but has to know it in English. 
because if he listens to it in technical ease, he's going to make a mistake. Well, that's it. that's why lawyers are generalists. That's what they're paid to do. I, I think is to is to in a very complex, uh, very modern society filled with technology, uh, they enable all that to work. Is there a part of the brief that you consider most important? I think the the. Uh, the beginning. I mean, I want to see what the question is, and the end. I want to know what the summary is. And I, I think the the if I had to emphasize one in a brief in this court, the description of the argument. I'll go right to the table of contents. I want to know what that argument is, and I want to know the points. I want to know the main points. In part, I want to know if I've already read them in another brief. What about the questions presented? Questions presented should be fairly presented. I mean, here there isn't usually a question of that because we've granted to consider a particular question presented. Don't try to load the question in your favor, you know, uh, it just won't be read. Just say what the question is. Do brief writers have any common failings that you would consider annoying habits in reading their briefs? Too long. Don't try to put in everything. You know, use a little editing, I would say. If I see something 50 pages, it can be 50 pages, but I'm already going to groan. And I'm going to wonder, did he really have to write that 50 pages? I would have preferred 30. And if I see 30, I think, well, he thinks he's really got the law on his side because he only took up 30. Now, I'm not saying you always do that, but uh, trying to be succinct, absolutely clear is the main thing. It saves me a lot of time. Are there any questions about writing that I should have asked you but didn't? No, you've been gone through a lot. Well, thank you, Justice Breyer, for your time. Good. It was helpful.